Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the last panel of Screen Age. Uh, last because probably this is the biggest panel with seven panelists, all who love the sound of their own voice, myself included. Um, I think it's going to take us about 40 minutes to get through just introducing who's here. So I'll save everyone some time. Meet Siddharth, 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 Siddharth and Suveer. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we got a bunch of Siddharths here and just to make it more exciting, they put the bald guys on either side. So let's have some fun. We'll try and make it not confusing with too many Siddharths. Of course, we have the pretty lady right in the center. So Ankita, we're going to kick off today. But because, uh, before we kick off with you today, Ankita, of course, uh, we're here to talk about video. Uh, yes, we're in a post-COVID world. Yes, content consumption has gone through the roof. Yes, OTT platforms are recording groundbreaking numbers. Uh, we know all of this. We're going to talk about all of this in detail. We're going to talk about the role that different platforms platforms play. We're going to talk about the role of the creator and we're also going to talk about the role of 5G in video. Although Dolly, we were paying attention to your presentation and we did realize that you say that 5G isn't really going to change the landscape in video too much. So I guess the panel is done. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, cool. So let's get this show on the road. Uh, panelists, thanks so much for taking time out today and joining us uh, and sharing your insights with uh, the Screen Age group that's gathered here today. So of course, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> in this post-COVID world, in this mobile penetrated world, uh, content consumption has taken new dynamic and new paradigm. And having said that, uh, we're going to try and de uh, de debunk a few myths over here, break down a few uh, uh, facts about how con the content landscape is evolving given mobile phone penetration, given the fact that OTT is reaching new heights. Now, let's start by trying to understand, uh, Ankita, we're going to start with you as the only woman on our panel. We're going to start with you. Uh, let's start by trying to understand why video has taken off so rapidly and aggressively as opposed to other forms of content, other mediums, etc., that haven't necessarily seen this kind of exponential growth over the last few years. What is it that has really thrown fuel on the video fire? Cool. So, Siddharth, Siddhant, sorry, Sid number three, let's call him Sid three. Let's do Sid one, Sid two, Sid three. Okay. So, Sid three, you know, of course, we've seen the advent of so many new video platforms also pop up, specifically during COVID, where every second person with a smartphone in their hand has become a creator as well. Now, with the advent of short form content, content consumption patterns have also completely changed, right? How do you see brands uh, or creators being able to harness this strategy to create video ecosystems that pan to a variety of audiences across platforms? Firstly, thanks for having me here, guys. So I think that's a damn good question, right? Because we're currently seeing an explosion, right? Anyone, like you said, anyone with a smartphone is essentially a creator, and that's, is, is, their smartphone is basically a moving studio. I think for brands, it's important to offer, firstly understand that you know each platform exists for a certain reason within their, within their category, and if your audience is there, you better be present over there, right? And especially, I, I think a very important point is to ensure that you know you don't have a singular message or a singular format running across every platform, right? Each platform for your category has a certain nuance. We play within that nuance, address address the kind of you know um, metrics that work over there. And I think it's also important for brands to perhaps let loose a little bit, right? Let rely on the creator to take your brand forward, right? I think creators do quite well when they're given that freedom to express themselves, right? And take a little bit of ownership away from the brand saying, you know, let me also define what you could be on this platform, right? And if brands are able to live with that courage saying, you know, let me rely on this guy, you know, he has, he or she has amazing creativity and let them figure out, you know, what my brand can be over there. So let make them part of your content strategy rather than, you know, just working with them and telling them, like, please speak about my brand or speak about the, you know, my, my features. This is... I think what is perhaps very, very important. You have to be active on those platforms and you have to rely on those creators on, that, on those platforms to take your brand message forward and not just dictate terms to them. 
Interesting. So you spoke about the authenticity of the tone of voice. You spoke, yeah. you spoke about the brand's openness to let creators be co-creators of the brand and help define their narrative and help define their landscape. Let's hear from one of the brand guys, actually. Sid One, uh, you know, you're a brand guy and you've been on the brand side for a while. You guys have been championing uh, video at TVS and, of course, worked with a number of creators. Why don't you talk about your experience in terms of how creators are able to retain the ethos of the brand and still do justice to the various different platforms that they specialize on while distributing to their audiences? as a variety of stakeholders uh, we have learned we have learned that we really really need to look at video content at multiple levels and define the objective very clearly there are certain video content which we create purely with the uh, need to build our brand presence and brand awareness whereas there are a certain types of videos which we create which is very very clearly targeted at bottom of the funnel uh, sales oriented activities the other one which we to maintain the brand essence and to maintain the uh, ecosystems respect for the brand what we have figured out is more than just talking about us we create content where our ecosystem is recognized and they believe that they are being talked about and our ecosystem partners our influencing partners who could be our mechanic partners or could be retailers they become the champion and hero of the video and in this way we are able to actually uh, i would say scale up our brand through our stakeholders and not just us keeping on harping about what we do and how we do that was brilliant, Sid. You said so much. You spoke about the role of video in the life cycle of the brand. You spoke about the consumer journey. You spoke about the video format to meet its specific goals. And then you spoke about real world influencers. Four bookmarks on that, uh, on that one, Sid. Um, I'm going to stay on platform a little bit before I come to consumer. Rupak, let's talk about a different kind of platform. Now, you guys at Bang Bang have been medium agnostic and platform agnostic with a lot of the content that you guys have created. Of course, a lot of us in the video space started with TV and ev eventually evolved to digital and with digital we don't have the same restrictions that television would provide for us 10 seconds 20 seconds 30 seconds even with digital now we started by doing editorial content then moved into branded content and now we've moved into OTT with brand integration coming into OTT content as well so why don't you share some of your experiences that the flexibility of digital has really given creators and brands alike Um, I think with Netflix turning on the tap of advertising in India, uh, around the world, and yet to do it in India, but in general, I think that question perhaps, answering that question perhaps becomes a little less urgent, but it's urgent nonetheless, right? And I think the, the particular thing, and this goes back to the principles of branded entertainment and branded content, as was being spoken about initially, right? People come onto these platforms, especially if they're paying to be on these platforms, they're going there because of the integrity of the content. So their, um, their tolerance to put up with brand messaging goes down tremendously. However, people aren't averse to brand messaging. They're only averse to irrelevant brand messaging, and that we've proven time and time again. If you've got a fabulous piece of branded content, and by fabulous piece of branded content, I mean one where, you know, there's always a balance branded entertainment, there's brand, there's entertainment. And as long as you have the balance, you know, tipped in favor of the entertainment, not just entertainment, I use that as a proxy for all kind of value that you can get out of it. It could be entertainment, it could be education, it could be utility, it could be information, whatever it might be. As long as they're getting that value exchange, essentially they're giving you 
their attention, um, and, you know, for so that you are able to, you know, provide that brand message. Um, I think that works fine, and that's something that brands are training themselves to do better and better. Agency partners are training themselves to do. But at the end of the day, remember that you're competing not just with other brands, you're competing with Stranger Things, you're competing with Family Man, you're competing with Sacred Games, you're competing with everything, right? So that's something that has to be particularly kept in mind. Um, I think that you're just starting to see the beginning of it, actually just scratching the surface. Uh, there are brands who've done that quite well. But also remember, you know, everyone can't be Apple and Nike, um, you know, and so brands need to know where they are, what they're doing, what they're ability to do things is, and so cut, cut your coat according to the cloth that you have as well. Um, and the ambition shouldn't get the better of you. I think that's very important. Um, and I think finally, the last part of it is that, you know, often enough when you look at this stuff, people often ask the question, and I, and I highlight this in particular because when suddenly the stakes are higher because you're competing with not just other brands, but all content that's available out there in the universe, then it's about the quality, right? And I think people often ask, why can't we produce content of a certain quality in India when we're competing on, let's say, branded entertainment forums or Khan branded entertainment lines, whatever it might be. It's not about, the, people often think it's about the budget and the money that we have, it's not that, right? Because there are brands who actually spend disproportionate amounts of money or when it needs to be spent or have the ability to spend it. The answer actually is time. And that's, the, that's where we get caught off guard in India, is that we often don't have enough time. And if we're able to do that, that's very important in order to provide that quality output. I actually want to circle back and debunk that myth because there are a lot of people who say, look, budget kitna hai, hum look, content aisa banayenge. And I want to come back to that because we're all on the agency slash creator slash brand side who have this restriction and limitation but are still able to work within our means. So I want to come back there. And R Rupak, you said something very interesting which is a bookmark for the audience as well, saying that effectively you need to be conscious of the fact that you are comparing for share of time of that user that he's spending in front of that screen, whether it's his iPad or whether it's his cell phone or whether it's his connected TV in this case, right? Um, which is all trying to eventually reach an audience. And the second bookmark I want to make for the audience over here is uh, Netflix turning on the tap as far as advertising is concerned, right? That's a bunch of red flags and a bunch of green flags depending on which side of the fence you're looking at this from. And when it comes to advertising, let me now come back to Karthik. Thanks for being patient with me. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, I promise you Karthik is, uh, has not turned white while waiting for his turn here. It was white before we got onto the panel. But we will come to uh, advertising here, Karthik, you know, given the fact that you do come from Group M and you've got a wealth of experience there, everyone's talking about, you know, segmented audiences and everyone's talking about the most effective way to reach these audiences. Now, platforms keep playing around with their algorithms and as a result, the concept of organic reach is continuously challenged time and time again, right? Influencers themselves, creators themselves struggle sometimes to keep up with this algorithm to make sure that they can maintain their reach and be relevant to their audiences. But having said that, what is the boilerplate advice that you have in order to meet these goals of letting brands reach audiences organically without falling into the trap of asking media plan mein budget kitna hai? I think Algorithms will exist as long as, as we're around. And, and there, there's no point in, in, in trying to limit. And what you're trying now will be very different two years down the line. But I think the, from a boilerplate perspective, to me, that's very clear, right? I think when, whenever, you know, like, like Rupak said, we all invest three, two, three minutes, we all decide to invest minutes when we start a video, right? And at some point in time, we want that content to resonate, either we or because that we feel very strongly about, or is it someone that we really like, right? So for a brand to be able to demand that sort of a time investment from the audience, you need to be on top of what is that peg, right? Why, why am I going to resonate with this? Why is the audience going to resonate with this? And for that, I think it's very important for brands to understand different subcultures, right? If you're creating something, you need to understand, uh, is the audio okay? Yeah. yeah. You need to understand how, how what, what, what is working in gratitude? If you're trying to create something on hip-hop, you need to understand what's, what's working in it. If you're trying to create something on, say, sports, you need to understand, you know, what is that subculture? How are people uh, likely to enjoy it? And then sort of go into the, the ideation phase. So to me, decoding the subculture ahead of time is that boilerplate. 
So I think classic advertising 101, everything starts with the insight, understand your audience, get the insight right, double down on the insight, and every, the idea, the messaging, everything stems from there. Um, Sid two, you said, sorry, Sid one, you said something very interesting about the role of content. I'm actually gonna loop Sid three in uh, into this conversation as well. I know it's really confusing to keep up. Let's just call them Sid. So Sid three, I'm gonna loop you into the conversation. You come in from the publisher side, right? For, for publishers, your balance sheet depends on the strength of your community, right? It's all about the size of your community for you. Uh, and I wanna talk about the role of content here because as far as community is concerned, when you're a publisher yourself, it's you're very conscious about how many audiences you're reaching, how relevant these audiences are to recruit them into the community because eventually you have a very different challenge from the rest of us. We are trying to buy media for our brands. You are trying to sell media to our brands. So you're looking at things from a very different lens altogether, right? So when we look at it as role of content, top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel, we're very clear about what that content needs to do for the brand basis, the life cycle of the journey. You don't necessarily look at it the same way. Why don't you shed some light on that? Thank you. So, uh, I believe the biggest challenge that we have faced is uh, there's an audience, but the audience attention span is very limited. And one thing we need to understand that uh, for anything to be popular, you need mass acceptability, which essentially video as a medium grew thanks to TikTok. So, TikTok is your, was your first, it's banned in India now, was your first shot to fame. You know, Suddenly you put a TikTok, you get followers, and you realize that you can become your own star in your locality without visiting maybe the YRF or a T-Series office for an audition. So, uh, like I was saying, when we created content, uh, action, emotion as means of uh, content ingredient played a major role. Secondly, the challenge for us was with the short form increase. Uh, brands tell us, Ek minute dekh rahe ki nahi, do minute dekh rahe ki nahi, teen minute dekh rahe ki nahi. The dropout rate was so high because people are used to the short form content consumption, be it on Reels or TikTok or ShareChat, etc. So how to map that audience and increase the audience attention span being spent so that they go to that moment where the brand messaging is there is very, very important. Secondly, if you can use UGC content for integrations, uh, that really helps where we have done campaigns for brands where we have said, why don't you make a reel with a brand messaging and if it's cool enough, we give it to the same jury who's maybe uh, adjudicating a Netflix kind of uh, entry and if you have made a good reel on a creative reel, you get to win an award. So that's how we have integrated some form of brand messaging which is very, very organic. Thirdly, like I mentioned, I'll take two minutes more that in the past, we have had experiences where every brand consumption uh, pattern was different. Uh, in YouTube, we put up a talk show with a very popular TV celeb, which got a lot of organic views, but on Facebook, it was not getting. When we reached out to the Facebook guys and what's happening, they said, why didn't you put uh, subtitles in it? So we realized that on Facebook, a lot of people were not listening to the video, they were watching on it. On YouTube, they were watching and listening together. So uh, for us, the internet audience, the consumption audience is very fleeting and the feedback is instantaneous. You know, if they like it, they like it. If they don't like it, they can go to the comment section. No matter what you do, there are multiple platforms where they come and say, you know, you're crap, then your business is gone. So it's very important that when you think about content creation with a brand, you should think of all the things that can go wrong when you put out that video. If you think of all the good, good things, then it's not going to happen. You should tick box the good and also the feedback part, which is absolutely negative, and then create plans around it. That was amazing, Sid. Actually, you said three very important things and three bookmarks there, right? I think this is the second time that we're reaffirming that content is about co-creation, whether it's co-creating your brand, whether it's about co-creating your narrative, which was amazing, right? The second thing you said is that the Indian audience is very fickle, and I'm going to come back to that because we can dissect that and slice and dice it, um, you know, uh, very interestingly and have some fun with it. And the third thing that I'm sure everyone has fun with on a Sunday afternoon is scrolling through the comment section of sticky content. So I'm definitely going to come back to that. Sit 2, I'm going to tag you in, right? Sit 2, right? 
yeah, yours it too. I'm going to. I'm also going to look at you when I call when I call you out. So you know, eye contact and all. Okay. Anyway, so um, so sit too. I'm going to tag you in. We're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to come back to the comment section of sticky content. But what is sticky content? Let's talk about a few examples. Stuff that you've watched. It could be editorial. It could be branded. What is sticky content? Stuff that's jumped off the page. Stuff that you said, man, I wish I made that piece of content. So. I love brands that can entertain and me. And tell us why. Sure. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of brands that choose to entertain you frequently. Like if there's something that's every day or maybe weekly. I'm not a big fan of brands that only wake up, let's say, once in a quarter, do one campaign and they move on. Right? Um, and I think a good example of brands that do that well come from sports. Right? Because, you know, while sports is very seasonal, they may, I mean, let's say a Rajasthan Royals is the brand that I want to talk about. They may be very relevant during IPL, right? But, but outside of IPL, they also need, you know, reasons for someone to actually come back to them. And the reason I like what they do is because, you know, they're able to create a robust content calendar that goes beyond IPL and is able to perhaps also circumvent a lot of challenges that can come, right? Like, you know, you may think that a sports team has access to players 24-7. That's absolutely not true, right? And there, there will be a lot of... Lots of other challenges, you know, based on whether your team performs, doesn't perform. So the way a sports team is perhaps able to, you know, still trap you, keep you hooked, irrespective of how well they're performing, right? Because let's face it, RR, I don't think has, you know, won in a long time, right? But it is one of the most well-loved well -loved sports teams in the world, right? And the way they're able to do that, right, is through constant fan engagement, is through ensuring that there is a very loyal base that will keep coming back to this page, irrespective of what happens on the ground, irrespective of who, which player has said what, or, you know, whatever other news may be circulating. I think they get it right every time. And, and there's, there's a lot of learnings that, you know, perhaps we can take from sports brands and apply onto other brands that are interested in sports. And we've done that actually with brands like Aether. Aether is one of our brands, you know, which recently partnered with Gujarat Titans. There was so much that we learned from what we did on RR that we put into our partnership over there because we were able to perhaps use, you know, um, you know, if you have taken up a sponsorship, you get certain entitlements, right? You'll get three hours with a player, and those three hours with the player will perhaps go like that, right? And you've sh practically shot nothing. So it's learnings from how they were able to use those three hours, right? That made a lot of sense to us because we got a lot of amazing, funny, scripted content featuring comedians, which otherwise would not have been possible. So uh, I love brands that can do that, you know, brands that are active throughout and don't just wake up on a certain day, and I think RR Rajasthan Rolls is a good example of something like that. And you guys, Aether did a pretty cool metaverse experience as well for uh, the IPL this year. If I'm yes, not yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And in fact, we have a lot of entries in the evening. I'm very excited. Amazing. <laughs> uh, we did that metaverse experience. <laughs> Karthik, you see a lot of content as well. So, a couple of examples from your end. What kind of examples? Of content that's jumped off the page, content that you said, I wish I had made this piece of content, and why? We did actually make that piece of content uh, for, for, for Mondelez. You know, I think the, the, the one that we did for Diwali with Shah Rukh Khan. Uh, and again, it, it goes back to what I was saying earlier, right? Like what, what really worked in that was uh, at a mass scale, if you're able to personalize content like that, right? and of course we used technologies like DeepFake. So, um, so, so that, that really, really, really works. Um, I'm also a huge fan of you know, internationally um, what brands like Tide do which is uh, take something that is on, on television and make that an experience, right? Uh, I like the, you know, I'm, I'm talking about it, it's a Tide ad uh, commercial. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's, it's a great case study. So to, to make television an experience is really a challenge, isn't it? Otherwise, it becomes this static thing that you watch once in a while, um, and then you sort of move away from that. But to make that an experience, to bring that to, la to life on, on digital and even to on-ground, um, I thought that was, that was fascinating. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'll, I'll think of more. Uh, so two, two things to bookmark over there, very interesting, right? You spoke about aided content. Aided content is A-I-D-E-D -E content, as in aided with artificial intelligence, aided with machine learning. We're going to come back to that. And you spoke about cross-media content as well, picking up a television asset and having fun with it on digital. This was a formula that we all had to do seven, eight years ago when we didn't have budgets, which we're going to come back to very quickly uh, to decode budgets on digital. But now, of course, if you have the ability and the flexibility to build differently for different mediums, how do you retain that authenticity and that consistency across mediums? And that's a great bookmark, Karthik. Sid one, I'm going to, um, uh, I'm going to come back to Karthik's first point. He spoke about edit content. He spoke about using tools. Today, there's Java 
Harvest, Copy AI, Rephrase, bunch of stuff that gives you so much technology to create dynamic content. Now, I would imagine in a rich ecosystem like yours, that creates immense opportunities to be able to dynamically manufacture this content for a variety of different purposes. Coming back to what you spoke about, I had bookmarked real world influencers. And I know you guys have done some superb work. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah. So, uh this is an example uh, which we had done using artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. So uh, answering two things, one is how without asking for a media plan, how do you organically make something uh, actually create the impact? And the other one is how do you actually uh, have your actual real world uh, impact creators as the influencer? So what we had actually done was uh, we partnered with uh, CSK uh, as principal sponsors last year. So what we got was we had a chance to actually record one of the superstars and uh, we had a one hour session with him where we actually created an avatar out of the superstar. And then what we did was we were able to make customized ads for 30,000 of our uh, retail and mechanic partners customized for each one of them. Uh, and we had done this in about four or five languages. English, Hindi, Tamil, Malayalam, uh, Bengali. So we had done in a variety of languages. So it became their own piece of ad. And we were very clear. So we did not endorse our brand or our product. So most of our retailers are actually multi-brand, multi-product retailers. So it was an ad for them where the superstar tells them that if you want these products, you go to this person's shop. So this actually at the bottom of the funnel helped us activate 20% of the inactive counters and also from the retailers and mechanic partners perspective, they felt very excited and happy about the whole thing. So I think from a brand perspective and from a bottom of the funnel perspective, I think it helped us a lot and we didn't spend a single buck on uh, media promotions. It just happened organically. Lovely. I think this is the third time for the audience's bookmark. Uh, Rupak brought it up the first time, Sid 2 brought it up, Sid 3 brought it up the second time, and Sid 1. We st spoke about the role of programming, right? I think Ru Rupak spent a lot of time on that. And then Sid 3 spoke about the Bollywood show that they made, which obviously had a few popular faces. And now Sid 1 spoke about the partnership with CSK, which obviously had a popular face as well. And thanks for that, Sid. You also spoke about without spending any money, you were on paid media, you were, you, you were able to activate 20% of unactivated offline channels. And we're going to come back to metrics, right? Um, but Ankita, I want to tag you into this conversation here because, of course, when you throw star power into a, into a video, it's going to shine, right? You put uh, CSK superstar and no prizes for guessing who that could have been. And you put Bollywood actors, you know, Sid 3. And, uh, you know, obviously these videos are going to shine. But when you don't have the flexibility of using these large-scale celebrities and you need to be more nimble, you need to be more agile, you have to get faces or personalities that are closer to the ground that will appeal to people on a slightly more realistic basis, right? And I know that you guys do a lot of work with micro, nano, on the ground that will create large-scale content which may not necessarily be supplemented with technology, as Sid one just spoke to us, but supplemented with great audience connect. Why don't you tell us some of, about some of the work that you're doing with Micro Nano to get this great audience connect and wide distribution at the same time? Sure. Uh, so I think uh, at Earnly, we, uh, we always say that we help you find your Mr. India. So that is not some celebrity, that is not some influencer who's become a celebrity, but it is that one influencer who's sitting in probably some uh, a place in Kerala which you might not even know of. But when this person talks about your product, your product will definitely get sold because of the factor of the resonation. So we did this one campaign called Dabba Maddo. And this was a campaign during Raksha Bandhan. And we actually uh, broke the norms of actually gifting, uh, by, uh, gifting your uh, fashion, personal care. We rather focused on uh, gifting a DMAT account. We rather focused on gifting a course by Udemy. Uh, we rather focus on gifting a bank account, uh, SIP, and these products which did not sell during Raksha Bandhan saw 32% hike in their sales. 
without any celebrities. So we tapped around 500 micro influencers from various regions like Gujarat, South Kerala, and uh, even up in East. And these influencers actually did the talking and they actually resonated with it. Yes, why should we give something that is perishable? Let's give something that will last long and something that the person will remember you for life. Okay, I started investing because my brother gave me a DMAT account. And that became a conversation starter. Once you have a conversation starter between your families and you discuss that, that is a campaign I generally resonate with. You know, I want to sit down with a campaign and talk to my father about it. You know, why don't we do that in, that in our family? You know, when you do that, I think that's a campaign idea I would want to resonate with rather than any superstar campaign. And uh, at only we have 2.5 lakh plus influencers, and these are all nano, small, micro influencers. We have housewives from Kerala. We have uh, housewives from uh, uh, from Gujarat who make the vlogs. But the kind of conversion, the kind of loyalty that the audience has, even one subscribe, unsubscribe to them, is a big pain. They actually come back to us and tell us that, ma'am. You know, this content is not working. Should we tell the brand and work on this content that will work out better for the brand also and audience will resonate as well. So yeah, I would always want to tell brand that it should be open to ideas because every content is different. Every creator is different. You don't know what the creator's audience is wanting to listen to. And nobody, not me, not you. It's the creator who knows the audience best. You know, you said that so matter-of-factly, Ankita, as if like everyone knows this, but thank you for those valuable insights. And what I really liked about what you said right now is that, you know, when you're trying to activate an audience in Kerala, you're bringing micro-influencers from Kerala that people relate to, and in all likelihood, they're not the influencers from three and four years ago, pre-pandemic, who are speaking English, right? Uh, if you bring influencers from the south, they're going to speak in re regional languages. And you see all languages, right, from Malayalam to Tamil, having exploded in terms of their content creation abilities, creators gaining mass populace, you know, on the various different platforms. Karthik, can you throw some light on how regional content has now started overtaking this homogeneous old world advertising English medium that we knew 15 years ago? There are many examples. Um, for example, I don't know how many in the audience know the most listened to podcast today in the country is actually in a South Indian language, right? And um, some of the, the engagement rates, you know, the, that you're seeing there, um, it's not just South, South, East, Marathi, some of the creators, and Ankita will know this really, really well, some of the engagement that you see uh, with a very small subgroup, a small language, a small region, etc., is the engagement percentage is just amazing. In fact, uh, in regional content, another thing that we are seeing is also that, um, you know, while engagement with brand handles on, on social media has come down drastically, you look at interest groups, right? You look at interest groups for like technology or cooking or home improvement um, or beauty for that matter. Beauty is just through the roof, right? Uh, there, a lot of the content is, is regional in nature and some of the engagements you see there is just, is just phenomenal, right? So very clearly today, uh, you know, these are bubbles sitting here in Bombay, in Santa Cruz, we really don't know about. Right? So it's important for, for data to sh sort of show you the way in terms of what's going on, and then sort of penetrate and infiltrate these communities. You know, that's, that's really interesting because you said how-to as a category, and how-to is actually, actually the second largest search term on, on YouTube, right? Uh, for a fact, and Rupak, I know you guys have also now branched out into creating a lot of how-to content, explainer content, small you know, pieces of content that actually influence the consideration side on the buy side, whether it's on commerce, D2C, uh, so on and so forth. So can you talk about how these, this, this small snackable content that's called A-plus content or how-to content really impacts consideration in the buying cycle? Oh, tremendously. I think my, um, in my other company, Jack in the Box, where we work with a lot of clients to uh, do various things in the digital space, but in particular, one of the areas of focus over the past three to four years has been on e-com content specifically, right? So we work with Unilever, for example, to um, create all the content for their specific e-com pages on Amazon and other platforms, for example. And video in particular, uh, and the, the evolutionary curve of how this has been impacting the consumer journey and consumer decisions is the, the evolution is tremendous over the past four or five years especially. You know, you can see how, um, you know, little tweaks, and as you all probably know, Amazon doesn't give you specific data on consumers, obviously, but there is this fair amount of insights that you can glean from 
uh, overall consumer behavior and, and we feed that into what we do and make those specific iterative changes on a regular basis to videos, for example. And it's phenomenally interesting to see how one little tweak can have such a, can make such a difference on buying, let's say, I don't know, Lipton green tea tea bags, for example, just by changing one word or one sort of uh, change and you, you don't even realize it. So it's really a great example of real time understanding of feeding back into the loop and iterating from there, especially because these videos are not really high production or, you know, sometimes they have a concept behind it, sometimes it's really functional and how-to in that respect. So it does work and it, it actually has a direct impact on that last stage of the funnel, which is the same. Well, we're at time. Um, sit two concluding remarks from you. 5G is around the corner. We're here to talk about 5G today. Gaming is going to go through the roof as a result. Streaming will go through the roof. We spoke about hyper-personalization around the corner. There's an advent of technology and automation that's going to penetrate this video, t uh, this video industry. Your thoughts, concluding remarks on behalf of the entire panel. I think the one thing that I'm excited most about 5G when it comes to video is gaming live streams. I'm a gamer myself, right? And I don't think it's going to impact anything else as much as gaming because, you know, you do need a very, very high bandwidth. To, otherwise, you know, you, you're basically looking at pixels. And the, the thing I love about gaming live streams is that it's not just about the game anymore, right? Like people come with their own passion projects. Someone may be taking an interview while playing chess. Someone may be talking about life or politics while playing a game like Among Us. And if we are able to, you, I think what 5G will allow us to do is turn gaming into a platform which is far bigger than just gaming and get more people into the mix, right? Because so far I think gaming, you know, as a gamer I can tell you that you know, we've been asked a lot of questions saying, hey, you're a gamer, hai, tu kabhi you're, you're, you know, you're almost 40 now, why are you still gaming, right? And there, there, there is that certain stigma, but I think with, with stuff like this, with live streams becoming really popular, we would expect everyone to look at gaming as a much, much bigger place, right? You have coffee with Karan where you're just having coffee and you're talking about life, you can do the same over gaming. And if it, I think if 5G can democratize that, then nothing like it. That's the one thing that I am very excited about, looking forward to it. Yeah. If I, I can just add to that, not as, not as a non-gamer, but the parent of two gamers, I actually see that and over through the pandemic my entire impression of that changed and I think the killer app and the killer combination here is 5G with gaming engines that yes. you have and that really changed the game for not just gaming, everything around it, that's all. Well, thank you, panelists. It's been a lovely 40 minutes. Thank you, audience. We hope we were able to shed some wisdom and entertain you in the process. Uh, back to you. 